Andrew, and we pray, pray that the Lord will bless each one as we sit under the word. Thank you. Well, good morning, congregation. It's a blessing for us to be able to gather again in the, in the Lord's uh, presence and praise His name in, in freedom. Uh, our call to worship this morning comes from the psalmist, Psalm 145, where we hear these words. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. They tell of the power of your awesome works. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. That's what we've come to do this morning, to celebrate the abundant goodness of our Lord and God and to sing and to praise Him. So let's uh, spend some time in silence and individual prayer and seek that God would be in our midst and that He'd be at work. So let's pray silently and individually. Lord our God, uh, we recognise that uh, you are great uh, and we cannot fathom, we cannot get to the bottom of your infinite greatness. Uh, but we've come to uh, praise you for your abundant goodness to us and we've come to praise you that, that you are the God who is gracious and compassionate, that you are slow to anger and that you are rich in love. We come to praise you uh, for you are good to all. You are the God who has compassion on all that you have made. Lord, we've come to praise you and speak of the, the glory of your kingdom, uh, the, the wonders of, uh, of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which that kingdom, that only kingdom which will never end. Uh, we come to praise you for you alone are God and you are most worthy of our praise. Uh, and so we ask that your Holy Spirit would be uh, at work in our midst, that you enable, would enable us uh, by faith to see uh, your glory, uh, to behold your glory in, in the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would um, uh, open each of our hearts to, to know you better and to uh, enjoy the privilege it is to have true fellowship with you, uh, the living God. Uh, we, we pray that you would open uh, each of our, our lips to, to glorify you in, in, in song. Uh, and Lord, we ask that... Uh, all that we do this morning might be pleasing in your sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. Amen. Congregation, could you please stand? We've come to uh, meet with God uh, as his people, uh, and he warmly uh, greets his people, saying grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing together, we're going to rejoice that uh, our Lord is King. We're using the words of uh, Book of Worship 332, rejoice the Lord is King. Uh, let's lift our voices and sing together.
please be seated. And let's come together to the throne of grace in prayer. Will you join with me as we pray? Let's pray. Lord our God, we have come to rejoice that uh, Jesus is King, to uh, adore and honour and magnify uh, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we rejoice that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, that Jesus rules over each leaf and blade, that he rules over each human heart here and throughout the world, that he is the king of the kingdoms of this world. Uh, we rejoice that uh, he is the king who became man for us and for our salvation. We rejoice that the one who was with God for all eternity put on human flesh, was born as a dependent infant, and that he humbled himself, that he humbled himself uh, in order that uh, we might be uh, filled uh, with all the spiritual blessings that are found in him. Uh, we rejoice that Jesus is the king who's won the victory over sin. Lord, we know that we are sinners that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed. We have sinned against you in the things that we've done, but we've also sinned against you in the things that we've left undone. And so we thank you that through the, the cross that Jesus has won the victory over sin, that through his death our sin is forgiven, that through his resurrection sin's power over us has been defeated, that through his cross work the devil has been defeated. He can know longer accuse us because at your right hand we have a, a great high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. We rejoice that Jesus' kingdom cannot fail, that though earthly kingdoms might stand against Christ and his church, though at times his kingdom seems so weak and small, we are thankful that Christ will have a people. And he will protect and preserve those people and bring them to live with him in glory. And so we, we pray too for the extension of Christ's kingdom in, this, in the world today. We pray that he might rule over every heart here. And that he might rule over every area of our hearts. And we pray that as the gospel goes out today, that Jesus' sheep would hear his voice and come to the king. Lord God, we uh, rejoice that Jesus is King, and we pray these things in his precious saving name as we say together, Amen. We're going to sing of God's uh, grace to us in and through our Lord Jesus Christ using the words of wonderful grace. So let's stand as we sing together of God's grace to sinners such as us.
and we turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. We just sung of uh, laying at the feet of our Saviour, uh, all, all that we are, uh, and of course that's not just a, a phrase we say, that needs to come to practical expression in our lives, and so uh, we're going to read uh, from Deuteronomy 5 uh, of the way that, that God would have us uh, lay uh, all that we are at his feet. Our brother uh, Ben will lead us in the reading. So we're going to read uh, Deuteronomy uh, 5, uh, verse 1 through 21. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face, out of the fire, on the mountain, at that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, not your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbour's house or land his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. So far, the reading of God's holy word. We're going to continue our worship this morning by bringing to the Lord our God our gifts and our offerings. There's two collections today. The first is for the work of the church. And the second is for the work of Solomon Island uh, Work Group, uh, a, a word and deed ministry uh, which we support in the Solomon Islands as a denomination. Uh, while we're bringing our gifts and offerings, we're also going to uh, sing the words of Yet Not I. So we'll uh, remain seated, uh, we'll bring our gifts and offerings and we'll lift our voices and sing together. <laughs>
I'm going to uh, come to the Lord our God in uh, prayer now. Uh, will you join with me as we come to the throne of grace and bring our petitions and our thanks uh, to the Lord our God. So let's uh, pray together. Gracious God and our Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, you are the God who, who speaks to your people. Uh, that we can hear the voice of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, in the Scriptures, uh, and that in a moment we're going to be able to uh, come and, and listen in on a, on a sermon that, that Jesus himself preached, to hear uh, from our Saviour, uh, his life-giving, life-changing word. Uh, and, and Lord, we want to pray this morning for those who, who need, need to hear the word of, of Jesus Christ for our family members and friends who've never heard his voice before. We pray that you would work in their hearts. Lord, we pray for those who've strayed from our midst, for, for those who call themselves Christians, but who no longer have a hunger for worship or fellowship. And we ask that they might hear the voice of Christ calling them back. Lord, we pray for those who are, who are weary and facing difficult seasons in life. Uh, we think of uh, honey, uh, we think of uh, Ed as he recovers from surgery, we think of um, John and Maureen also as they recover from surgery, we, we think of those of our, our senior members and we pray uh, that the word of Christ might strengthen, uh, revive and, and comfort them. Lord, we pray for our covenant children, uh, we thank you for uh, the children we are, are blessed to have in the church and we pray too that they would hear the voice of Christ at a young age that you would work faith in them and that they would love Christ more than anything else. Lord, we pray also for Marietta as she heads home to South Africa uh, next week. We thank you for a time with family here. And we pray that your word would sustain uh, her and, and also Anne-Marie and, and the family as they say their goodbyes. Lord, we pray for those who bring the word of Christ, for ministers in our, in our churches and the Christian Reformed Churches of Australia, and we pray that you would uh, keep us faithful to your truth. We um, pray too for other faithful gospel churches in Toowoomba. Uh, we, we pray that you would bless the ministers who, who labour for you. We think of our uh, Presbyterian brothers, and we pray for Phil Morrow and Phil Daffy and for Josh Rowe. Um, and we pray that you would give them joy in your service. Uh, Lord, we pray for the work of the Reformed Theological College as they equip uh, men to serve in your kingdom. We pray that you would use them uh, and may they produce men who are thoroughly equipped to handle the word of truth. Lord, we thank you for the many uh, students for the ministry in our denomination. It's something we, uh, we've prayed for the last few years and we thank you for the answer to prayer. And uh, Lord, we pray for Vicar Marty and his family that you would be with them as they prepare to leave uh, Tasmania and to to come and, and, and join uh, with us here. We, we pray that you would bless uh, his time here, that he might be uh, well equipped to serve you for a, for a lifetime of, of ministry and the word and the sacrament. And, and Lord, as we um, seek accommodation especially, we, we pray that you would supply uh, for our needs there. Lord, we thank you for the freedom to proclaim the word of Christ. Uh, thank you that we can, we can meet uh, in freedom uh, here this morning to sit under the word, that we can meet for Bible studies, that we are free to share the word with others. Lord, we thank you for the, um, the, the labours of Indy Way, uh, for the evangelists working in India to bring your word uh, to the, into the darkness there. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray that uh, their labours might bear fruit. Lord, we pray uh, that you would sustain them in their sufferings and that the word might go out. Lord, we pray for uh, the Church of Jesus Christ also in the Middle East. Uh, Lord, we know that they don't enjoy the same freedoms we do here. Uh, we thank you for the advance of the gospel in Iran, that the church there is, is growing tremendously. We, we thank you that your word is powerful and that it cannot be chained. And so we pray that uh, the word of Christ might sustain and strengthen and keep our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that we might hear your voice, that we might hear what the Spirit says uh, to the church this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. Uh, will you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew? <coughs> so 
this morning we'll be starting a, a new series, well, continuing an old series actually in the Gospel of Matthew. So we've been in the, in the Jacob narratives uh, for several months and, and now we're, we're coming back to the Gospel of, of Matthew. And uh, if you recall, we, we did look at uh, Matthew late last year and early this year uh, and we saw the, uh, the introduction that uh, Matthew gives to, to, to Jesus and, and shows in, in chapters 1 and 2 how he's the fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecies. He's the Messiah, the Saviour that everyone's been waiting for. Uh, and then we saw how John the Baptist uh, prepared the way for Jesus and, and he announced that, you know, someone greater is going to come and he's going to baptise with fire. And then we saw how Jesus went out to the wilderness. Um, it's like a replay of, of, of Genesis uh, and where uh, Adam failed the temptations. We, we find Jesus uh, defeats the devil and overcomes uh, all temptation. Uh, then we saw the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, he began to preach, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come. Uh, then he calls some disciples. Uh, and now uh, we'll pick up the reading at verse uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 23. Let's hear God's word together. Uh, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. <coughs> Congregation, there have been many famous uh, sermons preached in history. Uh, I think of the sermon entitled uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, uh, preached by uh, Jonathan Edwards in in America. It had a deep and profound impact on his congregation. It's said to be the sermon that uh, precipitated the first great awakening in America where the, there was great revival. I think of uh, George Whitfield's last sermon. It is estimated that George Whitfield preached 18,000 sermons to about 10 million people over the course of his life. And, and uh, John Whitfield was, was close to to his final days and he was passing through a town in, in Exeter uh, and the people there begged him, come and preach for us, come and preach for us. And, and so uh, despite his weakened condition, he, he did uh, go and preach. It was obvious he was very sick and someone called out, you are more fit to go to bed than to preach. True, sir. True, sir, said Whitfield. And then Whitfield prayed and, and this is what he prayed. He said, Lord Jesus, I am weary in thy work, but not weary of it. If I have not yet finished my course, let me go and speak for thee one more in the fields. Seal thy truth and come home and die. Uh, and, the, and the Lord did strengthen his servant. Uh, he went and preached what some call his best sermon. Went for two hours. And then he did go home. And he died that night. I think of Billy Graham, uh, who's, who's preaching. Uh, probably the, the older generation here would still remember. I think of his five nights of preaching in Korea in 1973. He preached on Yoida Island on a runway that was used during the Korean War. And on the last night of his preaching uh, crusade, there was 1.1 million people uh, listening uh, to his sermon as it was translated into Korean. They listened attentively. And it's said that that sermon uh, made great uh, inroads for the gospel in Korea. Now, I expect that many of you will never have heard of any of those famous sermons. But most of you will have heard of the sermon uh, that we're looking at today. Uh, what we call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount uh, from Matthew 5 through 7. It is hands down the most famous sermon in the world. School children quote this, this sermon to each other. Even those... Uh, who've never read it, they say, don't judge, don't judge. They're quoting the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, 
the sublime prayer that Jesus teaches in this sermon is, is prayed all through the world today. Uh, familiar phrases from this sermon, such as not throwing the pearls before swine, uh, phrases about the narrow path, they are phrases that are in popular literature and culture. It is the most famous sermon ever preached. And so we're going to have a sermon series on the most famous sermon ever preached. There are, of course, challenges in doing this. Uh, the first challenge is our familiarity with this sermon. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've probably heard many sermons on this sermon. Um, if you read your Bible regularly, surely you've read the Sermon on the Mount dozens of times. And so you might wonder, well, is there anything here for me in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, you bet there is. Uh, because there is, of course, a world of, of teaching and of challenge and of deep spirituality in the Sermon on the Mount. The second challenge is the ethics of this sermon. Uh, Jesus uh, sets a very high standard for ethics in this sermon. Uh, some people claim that they, they live by the Sermon on the Mount. And they haven't read it, but they claim that they live by it. I, su I suspect they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, because we, we generally love most of the ethics here. You know, turn the other cheek, that, that's good. Take the log out of your own eye before you correct someone else, that's good too. Uh, we, we can see how, how these things make for a beautiful life. But sometimes we wonder, is it, is it really possible? Is, is Jesus speaking about real life here or is he speaking about some imaginary life somewhere else? Well, he's, he's describing here that the new life that proceeds when, when God has, has done a work of grace in someone's heart. Christians can and do live this way. Um, of course, we don't live this way perfectly. That's impossible. But we do begin to, to, to live out the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount in our daily lives. Uh, and so this morning, uh, we're just going to have a, an overview sermon and we're going to answer four questions. Firstly, what is the context of this sermon? What is the context of this sermon? Uh, the setting is Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Uh, that's Galilee of the Gentiles. So, so right up the front, uh, Matthew has, has told us Jesus is, is not just the saviour of the Jews, he's the saviour of the world as well. And his ministry in Galilee at this particular time was very popular. People from like, everywhere are coming to hear Jesus. His fame has spread. Uh, if this were the, was the internet, uh, we'd, we'd say it's, his ministry is going viral. Um, he's, he's, we've been introduced to four people he's called as, as his disciples, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And they would have been thinking, wow, we chose the right rabbi to follow. How good is this? This new rabbi on the block, he's going places. Um, but there's something that they are going to learn and that every disciple needs to learn about following Jesus. And that is that being a follower of Jesus does not mean that everyone is going to love you and that your life is going to be easy. Being a disciple uh, doesn't mean you always feel like you chose the right side. In fact, being a disciple means you're going to have to swim uh, upstream all the time, swimming against the moral current of society. So, so these disciples here needed to learn a little bit more about discipleship. And, and when uh, Jesus observes the crowds... Uh, what does he do? Well, he goes up on a mountain. And who does he begin teaching there? Well, he begins teaching his disciples, not the crowds. It's his disciples who come to him in verse 1. Uh, this is, in fact, the first time the Gospel of Matthew uses the word disciple. Uh, we already saw in chapter 4 the model of discipleship, that Jesus makes an authoritative summons to people to come to him. And then they respond with a whole-of-life response uh, of obedience in following him. Now, we know from the end of this sermon in chapter 7 that the crowds were listening in as well. So this is not like a, a secret discipleship lesson. Uh, but the text makes it very clear that this sermon is specifically for Jesus' disciples. 
And, and so that's important for us to remember as we hear the Sermon on the Mount. The applications and instructions are for disciples. So this is not a general code of ethics that Jesus is giving for everyone to follow. This is not some good morality for people to give to their children and, and you know, just live out this way and, and you'll have a happy life. Uh, it's kingdom living that Jesus is teaching his disciples. And, and it's important that we remember, this is not how you get into the kingdom. Jesus is not saying, follow these instructions and you'll get into my kingdom. He's saying, if you're in my kingdom, uh, these are the instructions for kingdom citizens. So, so one commentator said that instead of calling this the Sermon on the Mount, we really should call this the uh, Discourse on Discipleship. It's all about discipleship. This is how we learn to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. Secondly, where is this sermon preached? Um, we've discovered in chapter 4 that at, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's actually welcome in the Jewish synagogue, so he can go and teach there, the Jewish places of worship. Uh, but notice now Jesus has chosen a new location for his ministry. Uh, now he's gone uh, up on a mountainside. Uh, we know that around the, the Sea of Galilee, uh, there were very uh, many mountainous regions there, and in these mountainous regions, there are also plateaus. So you go up on the mountain, you could sit on a, on a plateau, and that's where Jesus is. Now, I'm sure the tour guides in Israel make an absolute mint from telling people this is where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, but the truth is, I mean, we don't know where he preached from. But we do know a little bit about the where. He was on a mountainside, and, and this is important. Uh, now, is there anywhere else in the Bible where a teacher goes up on a mountain and then he comes down bringing instructions for practical living for the people of God. Moses, very good. Moses, of course it's Moses. He does the same thing. He went up on a mountain, he received the covenant law of God, he came down and brought that to the people. So, so Jesus is actually being portrayed by Matthew here as, as a new Moses. But he's not simply repeating what Moses said. Now he's, he's come to, to unpack for us the deep spirituality of the law of God, to give it, it, it its uh, fullest uh, meaning and, and understanding. He's going to show us that the law was never meant to be kind of some service obedience thing. It was always meant to be an obedience from the heart. And remember the... Um, Back in Moses' day, the people got the law after they'd been saved, after they'd been rescued. They didn't get the law, obey this and I'll rescue you. No, they were rescued, then they got the law. So too here, uh, it's for those already in the kingdom. It's for those who are already saved. Jesus is saying, this is how you show your, your love uh, and your thankfulness to me for my, uh, the salvation I've brought. You live as kingdom citizens. Note Jesus' posture as well. Uh, Jesus is sitting uh, he's not sitting because he's tired. Uh, sitting in, in that day was the posture of the teacher. Um, so obviously when I, when I teach, when someone teaches here, they, they stand and, and at, at the front of the pulpit. In those days, the rabbi would sit to teach. So maybe, maybe we should try that one Sunday morning. I'll sit up the front and, and you can all stand. <laughs> the, then the text says Jesus opens his mouth to speak. And we think, well, it's pretty difficult to speak any other way other than opening your mouth to speak. Um, this is actually uh, an idiom, an Old Testament idiom, and it means when someone opens their mouth to speak, they're about to say something solemn, something, something profound, something, something important. So this is the way Matthew is saying to us, pay attention to what Jesus is going to say. Pay attention. Are you paying attention? That leads us to our third point. What is this sermon all about? What is the profound, solemn, important thing that Jesus wants to teach us, his disciples, about? Well, it's uh, not an obscure thing. It's pretty obvious. It's right on the surface of the text. It's that he wants to teach us about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. This shouldn't surprise us, have a look at, uh, because have a look at um, chapter 4, verse 23. 
What is Jesus doing through Galilee? He's teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And, and, and so to those who've received those good, that good news, believed in the king of the kingdom, submitted to him, Jesus is simply unpacking, this is what life in my kingdom looks like. So, quick rehearsal of a few key, uh, key verses in the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus speaks of the character of kingdom citizens, in chapter 5, verse 3, he, said, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When he speaks of the righteousness of kingdom citizens in chapter 5, verse 20, he says that your righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes or the Pharisees or you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus teaches us to pray in the second petition, he teaches us to pray your kingdom come. When Jesus speaks of kingdom, sorry, on, when he speaks of priorities in, in chapter 6, uh, verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Uh, and then as he closes out the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So, so, so all through the sermon, Jesus is talking about uh, the kingdom. He's talking about life in the kingdom. He's talking about what life looks like under the saving rule of Jesus Christ. What does it look like? Well, the first thing he's going to tell us it looks like in what we call the Beatitudes is that it, that it looks like a blessed life. It's a blessed life, life in the kingdom. The essence of being a Christian is not that you have a perpetually sour look on your face and, and, and everything is horrible all the time. No, the essence of being a Christian is to be blessed. It's to be blessed. The Christian is the most blessed person. Blessed with a relationship with God. Blessed with forgiveness. Blessed with spiritual riches. Blessed with the Father's love and care. Living in the kingdom, it's the most blessed place to live. It doesn't matter where you live geographically, but living in the kingdom, oh, that's where it's at, Jesus is telling us. Uh, uh, but he's not just telling us it's a blessed place to live, he's telling us it's a very different place to live. It's very different to the kingdoms of the world. And you get that, don't you? Like, where you live makes a difference to, to how you live. And, and, and so, you know, a person living in a unit in inner city Brisbane... Uh, how they live is going to be different to the person living on a farm in Pittsworth. Vastly different lifestyles depending on where you live. And the stress in this sermon is that if you live in the kingdom of God, you're going to live a vastly different lifestyle to those who live in the kingdoms of this world. You can't be a citizen of the kingdom of God and look like a a citizen of the kingdom of the world. That's the message. Um, we, we could sum it up uh, in, in the words Jesus uses in chapter 6, verse 8, when Jesus says, do not be like them. Do not be like them. And, and so he has a twin meaning here. He's saying, do not be uh, like uh, the pagans, those with, with no knowledge of God. Don't live like them. And he's, he also says, well, don't be like the religious folk. Uh, don't be like the religious people who kind of do their religious deeds and they're just ticking their, their religious boxes as they go through the motions of their religion, not because they love God, but because they want other people to see them. So, so we are to be different, Jesus is saying in this sermon, different to the world. Citizens of the kingdom live differently. The things we believe, the morality we practice, the way we see life, our purpose in life, it's just different to others because we live in the kingdom. That's how it works. And there's no doubt we need to be reminded of that today. Because more and more, the world is pressuring uh, the, the church, Christians, to, to, to live the same as them. As Christians, the, the pressure is on that, that, that we might have the, the same viewing habits uh, as those who belong to the world and, and that, that we think it's normal to watch the, the latest smart on Netflix or wherever it is. Um, we can take on the priorities of the world and think that you know, living for an early retirement and accruing wealth is the most important thing available for us. We take on the world's view of the Lord's Day. 
this day, it's just, you know, it's just another part of the weekend. It's a day for a bit of sport and doing whatever. But the message of the sermon is, do not be like them. Jesus wants to teach us what life in his kingdom is like. And it's very different as we live in his kingdom. The key word to describe this, this difference in the kingdom is righteousness. Righteousness. Uh, doing what is right before God, that's righteousness. Doing what is right in his eyes, that's righteousness. Jesus says in chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So, in this sermon, Jesus, we might say, he's actually talking about sanctification. He's, he's fleshing out what does it look like to grow in holiness. Well, what it looks like to grow in holiness is, is that it looks like righteousness. So, so part of the gospel is that, that Jesus came. He came to save us from our sin, to save us from the guilt of our sin and, and grant us forgiveness and a place in the family of God. It's the wonder of what he, he does. But part of the gospel is also that Christ has come to make our lives new, to, to enable us to grow in righteous and become more righteous. And it's very important that we, that we understand this because we can have distorted views about what life in the kingdom is all about. Because some people think, well, life in the kingdom, what's it about? Oh, it's about being comfortable and having my best life now and everything going right for me. That's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches life in his kingdom is about righteousness. Some people think life in his kingdom is about having lovely religious experiences and, and, and always being on, on, on cloud nine because that's just how things work if you're in his kingdom. But that's not what Jesus teaches either. He teaches us that life in his kingdom is about righteousness. So, so Jesus is teaching us here, this is what life in my kingdom looks like. That's what the sermon's about. Finally, how should we respond to this sermon? How should we respond? Now, there, there are probably going to be many different responses as we go through the sermon. I think we're going to be surprised at times at what Jesus says. Some of the th things Jesus says are absolutely shocking. I think we're going to be challenged by what he says. I don't know how you cannot be challenged when you, you read the words that Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Are they not words of profound challenge? Uh, we're going to be humbled at times because sometimes, if we're honest, we're not particularly good kingdom citizens. And, and we're going to be driven to Jesus again for fresh supplies of his grace and his forgiveness. But one of the things I expect our response to be is that we'll be offended. We'll be offended. Jesus says some tremendously offensive things in this sermon. I think it's harder for us to, to get. It, it, the more familiar you are, uh, the less you understand the offence. Um, there was a professor, uh, Virginia Owens, um, she's a professor at the University of Texas, uh, and she gave her literature class a task, and they were to read the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and they were to come back uh, to her with their reflections on the Sermon on the Mount. And the dominant theme that came through in their reflections was they were grossly offended that anyone would dare say the things that Jesus said. This is not a politically correct sermon. Jesus would not be invited to come and speak at council or parliament. He's too black and white. He's too black and white. Jesus says the most remarkable things. He says, I alone determine what the blessed life looks like. He's going to determine... Uh, He's going to claim the right for himself to determine how you and I should be living. And it's not going to be where well, anything's okay as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. And he's going to say, I am the one who defines your eternal destiny. Your relationship with me depends on where your eternity will be. Now, if I claimed those things, if I said to you, I can tell you what the blessed life is, and I'm the one who makes that up, and I'm going to tell you how, how to live, and your relationship with me uh, d defines your eternal destiny, uh, you wouldn't listen to another word I said. Well, I hope you wouldn't. It's, it's, it's preposterous for someone to say those things. And, and Jesus is not going to end this sermon with a nice soft landing and, and this, this lovely invitation to, to come to him to find rest for your souls. You know how he ends this, don't you? 
He ends his sermon by speaking of the fact that he'll be the judge of everyone. And your eternal destiny is determined by your relationship with him. So what we're actually seeing in these verses is that Jesus speaks with authority. He speaks with authority. And the, and the people who heard him speak um, recognize this. If, if we could put the next slide up. Um, at the end of the sermon, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So, so this is not one of those take it or leave it kind of sermons. And Jesus doesn't give us the option of picking and choosing the bits we like about his preaching and the stuff that we're not so keen on. So we can't say, you know, I like the loving enemies bit and I like the not being hypocrites bit, so I'll take them, but you know, I'll give a bit of a pass on the sexual ethics of the kingdom and not making money my idol. No, no, no. Everything Jesus says, he says with authority. He expects everything he commands here to be obeyed in its totality. And you might say, well, I don't like the black and white statements. I don't like his exclusiveness. Surely there's another way to heaven. Surely he can't mean his morality is the only morality because, you know, we've moved on so far uh, in the 21st century. But do you see what you've done if you say those things? When you say those things, you make you the authority. You might say, who does Jesus think he is to speak like this? Well, couldn't the same be asked of you? Who do you think you are to speak like this? Do, do, do you know better than Jesus? Do, do you think Jesus knows less of the truth than, than you do? In the end, it all comes down to this. Will you recognise the authority of Jesus or do you consider yourself the authority? Are you the authority on life and on discipleship and on eternity? This sermon is about the authority of Jesus. There are, of course, many reasons that Matthew gives us to accept the authority of Jesus. Jesus does things no man can do. His deeds demonstrate his authority. And so we find he has authority over the created order, doesn't he? Uh, he stills storms with a word. He has authority over disease and sickness. We, we find that already here. People are coming to him and with a word he, he heals them. He has authority over the demonic world. The demons tremble at his voice and do his bidding. He has authority over death itself. He raises others from the dead and he himself is raised from the dead. Sometimes we, we balk at the idea of authority because uh, we understand that in this world people misuse their authority. Uh, that they, they use it poorly and, and abusively and they exploit people. But Jesus uses his power and authority for good. Uh, the, the one who has uh, all authority in heaven and earth, what does he do with it? Well, he comes to this earth and he lays down his life for sinners, for people who don't deserve it, for people like you and I. Surely if we are his disciples, we have every reason to bow before his authority and, and, and to obey what he says, even the bits that we might not like so much or we might not understand. If we're disciples, we bow before the authority of Jesus. So, what's the response that I want us to have as I preach a few sermons on this sermon? Uh, it's that we'd marvel not, not so much at the sermon itself, but that we'd marvel at the one who preached it, at Jesus himself. That, that here is someone with such authority that, that he can say things like this. That, that we delight in, in, in Jesus' understanding of the, the rich spirituality, the deep spirituality of the law of God. That, that we'd be captivated by the one who knows our hearts so well. He knows us through and through and he knows the areas we struggle with and that's, that's part of what he teaches on here. That we'd, that we'd be attracted by the beauty of the life that Jesus sets before us in this sermon. Uh, John Stott uh, wrote uh, a commentary on this sermon and he said, I have to confess that I myself have fallen under the spell of the sermon, or rather, under the spell of him who preached it. And as, as we unpack this sermon together, that's, that's my hope, that we might fall under the spell of the one who preached it, Jesus, 
Lord and Saviour. Amen. We're going to pray together. Will you join with me as we pray? <coughs> uh, Lord our God, we thank you uh, for all the ways that your word speaks to us. We thank you for this sermon recorded here of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that through it, uh, we might come to know Jesus better. That we might come to see uh, his, his righteousness and his grace and his glory and his authority all the more clearly. That just as we, as we uh, might admire a, a beautiful work of art and, and see how it, it speaks to the skill of the one who painted it, that we might uh, see in this sermon uh, the, the wonder of the one uh, who spoke it. Lord, we, uh, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we do want to submit to his authority. And so we, we pray uh, that you would teach us to trust his word, uh, to love his word, to believe his word, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, give us the strength uh, to live by his word. We pray this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. We're going to sing again now. Uh, we're going to sing, uh, you're the word of God the Father, so let's uh, stand and lift our voices together, uh, and after we've sung, please remain standing. closing song will be uh, Book of Worship uh, 160. Father, we love you, we praise you, we adore you. Um, and, and again, after the service, uh, we have the opportunity to, to join together in, in uh, fellowship uh, in the back hall, so uh, all are welcome. But now, uh, in faith, uh, receive God's blessing, His good word uh, for His people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen.